how do we as Christians respond to tragedies as a whole, whether they are massive natural tragedies, massive human tragedies in the shooting in Las Vegas, um, which when I say tragedy, obviously there are two completely different things. A, a natural disaster is part from a Christian perspective. And, and again, basically what I'm, what I'm going to address uh, today is, is basically along the lines of, all right, we have, as Christians, um, what we believe to be a revelation from God. And basically, you can measure where a group is going to be going by how much they believe this actually is a revelation from God or how much they seek to accommodate this revelation to external sources, uh, such as what is popular in society, whatever, whatever else it might be. And we are supposed to have something called the mind of Christ. It's not a phrase you hear repeated a lot um, amongst evangelical Christians or Reformed Christians, the mind of Christ. It should be, um, but we always talk about the necessity of responding in a way that is glorifying to God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means having a, a consistent Christian worldview. Well, what does that mean? Well, that, that means viewing the world as a Christian should view the world so that we respond in a way that's glorifying to God based upon his revealed truth, specifically in the person of Jesus Christ and explain to us and the abiding witness of the spirit of God and the word of God called scripture. Okay. Um, so why should we have to have that continually um, pressed upon us? Well, because the world is seeking to conform us to its image. And so we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. We don't want to be conformed to the image of the world. All right. So there is a battle going on. There is a, a, a conflict going on in being conformed to the image of the world over against being conformed to the image of Christ, having the word of God uh, operating within us, etc., etc. Okay, so to what do we expose ourselves more often? To the consistent teaching of Scripture? Um, the explication of that scripture in the, in the church, in the fellowship of believers, where we've gathered to be obedient to God's command and to be encouraged in the things of God? Or are we much more often exposed to the thinking of the world, the music of the world, the art of the world, the uh, literature of the world, uh, the social media of the world, which has a greater influence upon us? And what's the greater danger that, um, is it not that we are going to modify our Christian worldview so that it fits into a, a secular society in which we live, or that we are going to compromise very clearly on what we believe? When it comes to these issues, as I have listened to Christians responding to uh, both natural disaster as well as last evening, yet again, a example, not of the sickness of man. This was not an ill individual. This was not a sick individual. This was an evil individual. Right then, as soon as you... As, as soon as you become, can tell that you are uh, uncomfortable with the word evil, might tell you th which of the two influences is greater in your own mindset. Um, because the scriptures do not hesitate to identify the actions of man as 
being evil when they are in fact evil. And so when we, when, as, as I listened to Christians, it's one thing to listen to, and it doesn't matter whether they're leftists, rightists, centrists, as long as they're secularists, the, the interpretation provided by individuals of these, these events are pretty much all the same. They are, they are interpreted within a naturalistic framework. And so they may use, they may use different language in the sense of, you know, it's sort of like the different language you'd see between, um, Fox news and MSNBC. You're going to have different language. You're going to have people. It's more likely to hear somebody talking about sending prayers or saying prayers to pe for people and the victims on Fox News than you would on MSNBC. But when it comes to the motivations of an individual being evil, uh, when it comes to whether God has a purpose in these things, whether they be natural and all oh, people are when it comes to when it comes to something like where are hurricanes going to hit it seems to be perfectly fine then for god to be in charge because we all know we have computer models that sort of give us a cone of uncertainty right because we don't know we're not in charge we're not in control we we, we simply don't know where these things are going to go and as we know, weather is a fractal phenomenon. And, and so no one, I don't think, can ever know, uh, Star Trek aside, um, exactly where these things are going to go, exactly what their what impact they're going to have. We don't know. We don't know. So we're, people are a little bit more willing to sort of put that off to, you know, God's in control of that. But even then secularists today god's god's on vacation you know there if, if there's a god at all he's a deist and he's just observing he's not really involved <laughs> but especially when you get something like last evening what happens last last night you really start seeing the worldview impact upon how people interpret these events and as I listen to even Christians responding to these things, I'm really taken aback at how thoroughly secularized many people who claim to be Christians really are when it comes to these big events, these big issues. And it comes back to theology. And you can even have a good theology, but if you really haven't applied it, if you're not trying to really live in light of it, and some of you might say, well, it's, it's too soon to address this. Well, okay, which, which shooting do we want to use then? I, I mean, uh, which, which horrific act, you know, uh, I guess uh, my, my hotel in Berlin was, uh, what, something like 100 meters from where the guy last Christmas drove the truck into the, into the crowd of people. Okay, I mean, so we could, that's far enough away from now, half of us had forgotten about it. They go, oh, yeah, was that last year? Oh, you know, and that's the thing we're thinking of. And let's be honest, three weeks from now, we'll be thinking about something other than Las Vegas. That's the reality. Um, but when you think of the level of evil that lies behind someone on the 32nd floor. And this isn't, by the way, this is not just a modern thing. What was it? University of Texas? Was that where it was? The, the tower there, the tower shooter. That was like the sixties, wasn't it? 60, right? I think, I, I think I may have been born then a long time ago. Um, you know, you've got the shooter up there and this guy, you know, people are already starting to try to um, find motivations and all the rest of this stuff. I, I just go, hey, you know what? It's that news cycle time. And you got to put people on to say things. 
And so uh, almost anything that is said for the first week is primarily speculation. And I can't necessarily trust everything that I'm going to be hearing or seeing or anything else. So I'm, I'm one of those folks that says, let's, let's give it some time and, and make sure that some serious research is done. And, and even then, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical these days. But we don't, all we know is anyone standing up there with an automatic weapon, not a semi-automatic weapon, which you can buy at gun stores, you can't buy what this guy had at a gun store. Um, I realize that there's a lot of really confused people about that, uh, but that's another issue we won't get into today. Anyway, you're up there with a full auto weapon, um, fairly high caliber. I, I'm guessing AK probably. That wasn't an M16. I, I know the difference between the sounds, and uh, those those were heavier bullets. That was a that was probably a 30, uh, 30 caliber. Um, 7.62, something like that. Anyway, you're just pulling that trigger and you're just emptying out banana clips, probably 30 rounds each, um, into maybe into people who cannot fight back. You're just committing murder. And you know exactly what you're doing. You've been planning it. We look at something like that and the secularist who views mankind as merely as merely an animal a you can't even it's not even properly it's not even proper to say highly evolved animal because high assumes something that the secular worldview cannot actually provide just a complex product of evolution you look at that, and when you call that person evil, on what basis can you can you really say that? You're, you're begging the existence of a, of a objective morality to give your words any kind of meaning. You can find it horrific. You can use you can use terms to just you're shocked that anyone could do something like this. But it's it's just as has been pointed out. It's it's one blob of of sparkly stardust doing something to other blobs of sparkly stardust. That's really all it is when you boil it all down. And so you can talk about man evolving morality and, well, this is bad for the group as a whole, so that's why it's morally wrong and all the rest of that stuff. None of that does anything in here. We all know that's a bunch of garbage. We all know that that's, that's, that's made up to explain a particular scientific theory that people are absolutely dedicated to religiously. But how's a Christian supposed to respond to this? Because on the one hand, we say this individual is responsible before God for what he does. Responsible before God. And will be judged by God. And so that immediately raises the issue, well, could God have stopped this man? And obviously, we have to biblically say God could stop anyone from doing anything. The open theist says no. God didn't know what was coming. He, he knew it was a possibility, but he didn't know if the guy would go through with it. Which means that that's why the open theist, God doesn't know um, what, uh, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. He doesn't know when you're going to die because your death, in all probability, will be the result of numerous free will choices by free creatures. And God can't know that. And so the, the open theist goes, ah, uh, you know, God will do the best he can to put it all back together again. And I'm not even including process theology and all the rest of that garbage in this right now. We'll just stick with uh, these things. But if you're a Christian and God doesn't have a decree, then when God created this world, he knew this was going to happen, if you believe in divine foreknowledge. 
God knew this was going to happen, but he doesn't have a purpose for it. He just, you know, either you do the Molinist thing and that, I, I, I don't even know how you go there. You know, God's just, those were the cards that were dealt and somehow to get the best result, you had to include this guy. I'm not even mentioning his name. I have him memorized his name, and I won't give him any 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 fame. But somehow, I guess God had to include this guy in the mix, and God knew he just could do because of middle knowledge. But there wasn't anything to do about it, and somehow he just had to work it in here, uh, so as to protect man's autonomy and still get the best result. This was. This was the best God could do. Uh, that's the Molinist understanding. Well, someone says, how about you, Mr. Calvinist? God decreed that this man would do that. There wasn't anything he could do about it. <laughs> wasn't anything he could do about it. Um, I was looking at the book of Isaiah, and I was... Listening to what scripture says, I am, this is Isaiah 45, beginning of verse 5, I am Yahweh and there is no other, besides me there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am Yahweh who does all these. And as you, as you know, in Isaiah 45, 7, well-being is shalom, creating shalom, and creating ra, calamity or evil. I am the Lord who does all these. And he's talking similarly to what you have in Amos 3. Um, when, in asking a number of questions, one of the questions that's asked in, Isaiah, in Amos 3, 6, if a calamity, and that's ra'ah, same thing, if calamity occurs in a city, has not Yahweh done it? Well, a lot of people would say, no, no. But the fundamental understanding of Yahweh in the Old Testament, this is one of the reasons that the Brian Zons of the world don't really, you know, they, they want a different God than the God of the Old Testament. Um, they don't want to believe this. They don't want to believe that, that Yahweh does whatever he pleases in the heavens and the earth and the seas and all deep places and, and that he accomplishes will and, and no one raises a hand to say, why have you done this? They, they, they don't want any of that. They don't, that's not something they're interested in. Okay. If you believe that God has a sovereign decree and he's accomplishing his purposes... What happened last night is a blip in history. I mean, what, what we're up to 58, I think, the last, last I saw, 58 dead and over 400 injured. Over 500 injured. Um, ever heard of the firebombing of Dresden? You've heard of Hiroshima, Nagasaki. But uh, the firebombing of Dresden? where we didn't use nuclear weapons, but we used conflagration devices, incendiary devices, that literally fried people where they lay on the streets and turned them into charred... I mean, you had to just dig them off the pavement. It was so hot that it, it melted people right into the ground. Um... There have been horrific things that have happened in human history. And I, I think one of the problems is so few people today know anything about history. We, we don't have a context to put things in. And as a result, whatever we're experiencing now is always the worst it's ever been. It's not the worst it's ever been. It isn't. Um, you can you can deceive yourself into thinking it is. Every generation wants to think it's never been this bad, but it's 
it, the, the fact of the matter is the history of man's ability to engage in these things is long. And you go, okay, fine. Let's, we'll take that as a given. You mean God has a purpose in all this? To which I respond, biblically, when that tower fell in the days of Jesus, and Jesus made reference to it. You remember how he made reference to it? He didn't say, oh, that, that terrible tragedy. Oh, I'll have to question the goodness of God that something like that could happen because this tower is being built. It, it collapses. That happens, happened more in the ancient world than it happens today, but it still happens today too. Jesus made reference to it. We're talking about the incarnate Son of God. Um, and he responded to it in the proper way, in the right way. We need to respond to it in the same way Jesus did. He didn't view it as something that was outside of God's control. Here is Jesus taught a sparrow doesn't fall. A sparrow doesn't fall without God's knowledge. And it's not just, oh, he's just observing everything. Jesus believes in the absolute sovereignty of God, the kingship of God. I, Jesus believes every word of the Old Testament because it was he by his spirit that gave it to us. If you're a Trinitarian, you believe that. And so, Jesus' response to what seems to us to be a random tragedy was to remind us of the brevity of life and the judgment of God. You think you're better than those people that the tower fell on? You're not. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Or you'll likewise perish. What does all this come to in my thinking? What I didn't hear many Christians, and, and you know what? Brother Piper gets really ravaged on this one. He, he's consistent on this subject, and it infuriates people. But John Piper, over and over again, refers to the reality that if we have a biblical worldview, if we allow scripture, if we allow what we believe about God to determine how we interpret what happens in the world, which is what Christians should do, what most people do is you look at what happens in the world and you create a God to try to fit what you see around you. You're not big enough to do that. You're not smart enough to do that. You don't have enough information to do that. This is where medieval man, man before the not so much enlightenment. That's a, that's a, by the way, the term, using the term enlightenment, I, I know it's just historically been used for a long time. That is so arrogant. It, it should be the, the, some other term, but enlightenment, assumes we're just so much, so much smarter. No. Medieval man knew something that we don't know. That we've forgotten. And that is, we are not big enough to be the center of our thought process about the world. We are creatures. We need something outside ourselves. We need a God who made us. They understood that. We don't. The result's been chaos since we've forgotten that. And so when we look at what is happening around us and we ask, what is God's purpose? We cannot demand of God specific revelation about his purposes in each event. And when, when John Piper talks about God's judgment in natural disasters or in things like this. 
a lot of times people misinterpret that to say, well, so you think you know that there was something really bad going on in Houston, and that's why this storm blew up so quickly and caused such devasta devastation. <coughs> and there was something going on in Puerto Rico uh, and Florida with Irma and, and, and all the rest. Of, it wasn't Irma in Puerto Rico. It was the second one, Maria. Um, so, so you think there's specific things in those areas? No. No. I can't know. I mean, if I were to say that there, you know, God's judgment has to come where the worst sins are, I don't know where they are. I can take a wild guess, but only God knows the hearts of men. And because we can't say, hey, this is the sin that caused this act of judgment, then a lot of people go, well, we can't know that at all. We can't, we, we shouldn't talk about God's judgment. Jesus did. Jesus warned us that we are going to face the wrath of God. We are going to face judgment. A day of judgment is coming and there is punishment for sin. And so because we can't know specifically what's happened is the vast majority of Christians, when you look at a hurricane, they won't ever mention the wrath of God. Because, well, we're naturalists. And the fact is, hurricanes have been hitting the plot of land that Houston is built on, or New Orleans, or Florida as a whole, for a very long time. And in fact, uh, back in the days of Moses, there were hurricanes hitting what would eventually become known as the United States of America. Now, there weren't very many people around. We don't have any record of them, but I can guarantee you there were Cat 1s and Cat 2s and Cat 3s and Cat 4s and even Cat 5s. Oh, yeah. And they blew over trees and they may have killed natives, um, but we don't know anything about it. We don't have any barometric pressure readings to be able to compare them with or anything else. But they were going on, and you say, well, 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 how can that be about God's judgment? How could the falling of the tower be about God's judgment? We live in a fallen world, and God allows these things to happen. He decrees that these things are to happen, whether they are natural in the sense of outside of man's control, or whether they are, the, they are these, um, heard of a guy named Herod? Heard of a guy named Herod and Bethlehem? Little children? Uh, do you happen to recall that that was a, oh, that was a prophesied event? If it didn't happen, God's knowledge itself would be falsified. God prophesied it. Not because he looked in the future and said, oh, oh, oh. God had a purpose in it. And when he lifts that hand of restraint, because that's how this type of stuff happens, horrible rulers like Herod would do the Bethlehem kill the kids thing much more often than they do if God did not restrain them. And if you actually believe that, then you got you got to believe all of it. So God decrees these things to happen for a purpose. And if we take Jesus' example, what we should do when we see these things is be reminded of the fallen state of the creation and the need for every single one of us to repent and believe. And we should be calling our fellow citizens to repentance and faith. Oh, that sounds so out of step with the world. Yeah, it is. It is. That's what Jesus did. That's what he calls us to do. And think about it. Here are all these folks. I saw <laughs> some of those videos started coming out this morning. One of the very first ones, the guy in the tent. 
yeah, I, I saw one of a guy in one of the VIP tents, and they're crawling around because bullets are ripping through the fabric and stuff like that. And there in the middle of all of it goes this guy. He's still standing up. He's not even running. And he has not put his beer down. He's got a big old plastic cup of beer, and he ain't losing it. He may lose his life, but he ain't losing his beer. There's priorities for you. I, I just sort of watched it like, Wow, no one's going to notice that, but I did. Here are these people. How many of them had given any thought that day to eternity? Very few. The fact of the matter is none of us have any promise of tomorrow. We always say that theoretically when we talk about getting in our cars and driving down the road. And that's true. But all of us expect to get home. But here's people seem like a safe place to be. And then all of a sudden, death rains down upon them. And it takes a while for people to even figure out what's going on. You don't expect anything like that. The Christian message is we should always be prepared for something like that. Not in the sense of whipping out your sniper rifle and returning fire. But we don't have any promise of tomorrow. The great power that was exhibited in Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God was in the vivid revelation it gave of the reality that mortality is that we are walking on a rotten bridge over the yawning chasm of hell. And that is where every single person is outside of Christ. They're walking on a rotted bridge right over the yawning chasm of hell. That is the proper way of looking at it. And it brought such conviction because it brought the reality of one's mortality and the reality of God's judgment. And so as Christians, we see something like this, we pray for the victims. And what do you mean we pray for the victims? You know, everybody says that. What does that mean? Well, for believers, we pray for their comfort, their witness. For unbelievers, we pray that for the survivors, the gospel will come to them and that they will bow the knee before Christ. But a lot of people would like to say, well, but what about those who weren't? Today's the day of salvation. There's no post-mortem salvation. There's no praying for folks once they're gone. It's the point of the man wants to die. That's what makes the gospel so vitally important now, not somewhere down the road. When we look at these things, if you are embarrassed by the reality that these things demonstrate God's righteous judgment against sin. That sin is, Romans 1, God's wrath is being revealed, not will be revealed. It will in its fullness. But God's wrath is being revealed every single day against the ungodliness of man. You say, but I can't, I can't hold that together with... The idea of God's decree. Well, that's why you need to you need to have Joseph's mindset. You need to understand why Joseph was right when he said, You meant this for evil, God meant it for good. God is big enough to be holy, to be omnipotent, omniscient, and the absolutely free king of all that takes place in his creation, and still hold man accountable for acting upon the desires of his heart. God's big enough. 
don't try to bring him down. So he's small enough to fit into your categories. He's big enough to answer these questions. And so as we, as we look, as we will over the next few days and weeks, maybe come to have more knowledge of motivations, the reality is that God was not taken by surprise. If any believers were cut down in this event, can't every believer read the 139th Psalm, my days are written in your book? Is that not true for all believers? All people? We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring to us. None of us has a guarantee. On the one hand, as one missionary said, until God has determined the day of my, until the day that God has determined for my death, I cannot die. That's true. I mean, think about it that way. That's true. Until, you know, if God has said that I am going to live and serve him until such and such a day, <laughs> all the powers of hell cannot change that. I can't die. But the reality is, when I come to that day, I can't live. God's in control of that. And that knowledge is not given to me. That knowledge is not given to me. So I must live each day with my focus upon being a servant of Christ and being ready to meet him. That's really what the imminent return of Christ should mean to us. Is that whether... He returns and gathers all of us together, or he returns in bringing me to himself in my own personal death. We should be ready. We should be ready. 